No Calvary. All right. Well, let's begin. Welcome to Sunday School. We have finished going through the first four C's of history, those profound, those majorly impacting events of, of our history, creation, corruption, catastrophe, and confusion. And so now we enter that action-packed period of time between the fourth C and the fifth C, roughly 2,200 years between confusion and Christ. Now, the next part of Genesis, Genesis 12, it picks up with the account of Abraham, the foremost patriarch of the people of Israel. But because our curriculum moves chronologically through the Bible, we actually need to step out of Genesis for a moment and talk about another man. We're going to talk about Job. Now, you know Job, and we are somewhat familiar with his story, but have we... Have we taken hold, have we really taken hold of the profound life truths that are on display in the account of Job? In one sense, the record of Job is a lesson about suffering and endurance. But in a greater sense, the book of Job is a lesson in humility and faith. And we're going to consider those today. Only taking one lesson to look at Job. That's 42 chapters in his book, so it's definitely going to be a bit of an overview today. Here's the outline of what we're going to do. We're going to introduce ourselves to Job and his situation as we investigate Job chapters 1 and 2. And we'll overview the dialogue between Job and his friends, which dominates chapters 3 to 37. And then we'll analyze God's confrontation with Job in chapters 38 to 42. Now, just to warn you, it might get a little bit emotional in this lesson. <laughs> I find myself very much empathetic towards suffering, even if it's someone who's who's long dead. So I might I might tear up a little bit talking about Job. I think in some ways it's appropriate because we don't want to be too distant from even things that happened in the past. This is a real person, and he experienced these things really in his life. And it's meant to inform us not just about his suffering, but about all suffering and also about our our proper stance and our proper relationship with God. So I hope that you're also appreciating properly the impact of these things. Now let's pray before we go on. The great God, we, we need this truth. We need the wisdom of the book of Job. So God, I pray that you'd help me to be able to explain it. I pray that the people would be paying attention to it. They would really apply it. Lord, that we would humble ourselves before you so that you can exalt us, even God, when we don't understand. But I know that there are different ways that the people of Calvary are suffering or have recently suffered or will suffer. And so they need this truth. So I pray, Spirit, that you would work mightily in your people now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, let's start at the beginning. Please open your Bibles to the book of Job, chapter 1. If you're not familiar, Job is roughly in the middle of the Old Testament, right before the books of Psalms and Proverbs. Might be wondering why some people think Job appears between the Tower of Babel and the patriarchs of Israel. To answer briefly, I'm just going to quote some of the details listed in the John MacArthur Study Bible. What are some of the reasons we think that Job comes next? Well, Job's lifespan. We're not told his precise age at the beginning of the story, but he is old enough to deserve respect and to serve as an elder, yet he's young enough to be able to have more children. And at the end of the book of Job, he actually lives another 140 years, 140 years. This is beyond whatever age he was in the beginning. So Job probably lived more than 200 years or more. And for comparison, Abraham lived only 175 years. So Job fits that period of still long life, but decreasing lifespan after the Tower of Babel. Another detail, the social unit in the book of Job is the patriarchal family. The Chaldeans who are mentioned in Job are still nomads and not city dwellers. Job's wealth is measured in livestock primarily and not in gold or silver. That's typical of the, the patriarchal um, times and times after Babel. Job has a priestly function within his family. And Probably most significantly, there's a basic silence in the book of Job on such important subjects as the covenant of Abraham, the people of Israel, the Exodus, and the law. So all these things make us think Job probably took place after Babel, but before or just around the same time as Abraham. Now, who wrote the book of Job? 
We don't know. The author never identifies himself. We might think that it's Job himself, since he would be the best one to remember all these details, remember the dialogue between his friends, and it is quite an extensive dialogue. But though it could have been Job, that probably isn't the case, because the message of the book of Job depends on Job not understanding what God was really doing. So it would be strange for God to try and present this lesson and then tell Job what's going on. Another Talmudic tradition, Jewish tradition, is that Moses wrote the book of Job. He could have done that, even if he lived after the facts, by God's spirit and uh, by oral tradition passed down that the spirit was guiding Job to, or not Job, Moses to accurately write down. That could have been the way Moses wrote it. Could have been Solomon, even though Solomon lived even later than Job. The same same process of inspiration could have enabled Solomon to write it. And Job is considered one of the wisdom books of the Old Testament. And Solomon wrote most of the other wisdom books. Uh, sometimes Elihu is mentioned as a possible author of Job. But in the end, we can't say for sure. Now, let's start reading through the first two chapters of Job. But we're going to take this in little, little pieces. We'll start with just Job 1, verses 1 to 5. We're going to observe these different sections. And after we look at Chapters 1 and 2, we'll come back with some interpretation questions. So Job 1, verses 1 to 5, please follow along as I read. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless, upright, fearing God and turning away from evil. Seven sons and three daughters were born to him. His possessions also were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and very many servants. And that man was the greatest of all the men of the East. His sons used to go and hold a feast in the house of each one on his day, and they would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When the days of feasting had completed their cycle, Job would send and consecrate them, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings, according to the number of them all. For Job said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. All right, let's just start with observations of this little section. Notice the descriptions of Job in verse 1. Blameless, upright, fearing God, turning away from evil. And these descriptions all roughly mean the same thing. So why would the author use so many of the descriptions together that all mean the same thing? Exactly, this is for emphasis. And this is not unlike a certain other person that we've talked about recently in Genesis. Noah also had this kind of treatment, or repeated descriptions all used right next to each other to show this is a thoroughly righteous man. Get the point. This is a righteous man. We're also told that Job lived in the land of Uz. Now, Uz is the name of one of Aram's descendants. Remember, we talked about the descendants in Genesis 10 uh, not too long ago. Aram is a descendant of Shem, and Aram settles in the land of Syria. That's why some Bibles actually translate the name Aram as Syria. So where's us? Well, we don't know exactly, but it probably wasn't too far from Syria considering the line of descent. So probably south or east of Syria, or even in the land of Syria is where Job lived. Notice Job has 10 children, seven sons and three daughters. It's a nice Nice family there. Notice his level of wealth. He's extremely rich. Text goes so far as to call him the greatest of all men of the East. There's tons of livestock, tons of servants, and enough wealth for his kids to be holding feasts pretty much every day. Now notice Job, though, is also offering sacrifices on behalf of his children because he's afraid that perhaps they've sinned and not made offering to God. He wants to offer on their behalves. And notice it says that he did this continually. Job's offering sacrifices for his children continually. So here we get a basic sense of who Job is and what kind of wealth he has. But now let's read verses 6 to 12. Back to chapter 1, verses 6 to 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them. Yahweh said, of course, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh said to Satan, from where do you come? 
Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, from roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. And Yahweh said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil. Then Satan answered Yahweh, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge about him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Then he always said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not put, your, put forth your hand on him. So Satan departed from the presence of Yahweh. All right, let's observe here. Notice this scene takes place before Yahweh, probably in God's throne room in heaven. Notice who's there. The sons of God, Yahweh, and Satan. Sons of God here, understood as angels. Notice who starts the conversation. God does. Notice who first mentions Job. God does. And notice how God describes Job. Many of the same descriptions we just heard earlier in chapter 1, but God adds that Job is God's servant and that there is no one like him on the earth. As if we needed more emphasis about the righteousness of Job. But Satan gives a cynical explanation for why Job fears God. Job only fears God because God blesses Job materially and he protects Job. God has given Job many possessions. And what does Satan say will happen if God takes away Job's possessions? Job will curse God to God's face. So absolute rejection and repudiation of God. And notice God's response to this accusation from Satan. God gives Satan permission to do anything to do anything to what Job has, but he will not let Satan touch Job himself. Now, we'll ask some interpretation questions in a little bit, but let's continue to observe. Let's now look at the last section of chapter 1, verses 13 to 22. By the way, you notice there's no observations appearing on the slide. There's just too many to list, too many sections here, so just keep them in your mind. And on the slides, I'll put some interpretation questions in a moment. But now let's look at chapter 1, verses 13 to 22. 13 to 22. Now, on the day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding beside them, and the Sabaeans attacked and took them. They also slew the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While well, he was still speaking, another also came and said, the fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, and consume them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands and made a raid on the camels, and took them and slew the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and behold, a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they died. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped. He said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. Yahweh gave, and Yahweh has taken away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh. Through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. Now here's an amazing passage, especially its ending. Let's observe again. Job gets messages from four messengers in this passage. And notice how far apart each messenger arrives. Each one arrives while the other one is still speaking. And they come with tidings of great calamity, four great calamities announced to Job all at once. First, the Sabaeans, they stole all of his oxen and donkeys and killed Job's servants. By the way, the word Sabaeans is Sheba in Hebrew, 
So it would have indicated one of the people groups mentioned in Genesis 10. Two times we see Sheba there. So we have the Sabean raid. Then second, fire fell from heaven and burned up all the sheep and all the servants who were attending them. It's fire for heaven may refer to lightning. But they're all, they're all burned up. Third, the Chaldean raiders, they came and took all of Job's camels and they killed the servants that were attending them. And then fourth and finally, the wind blew down the older brother's house and all of Job's children were killed. Now that is a dagger in the heart, is it not? Job, you've lost all your wealth, and on top of that, all of your children. I mean, imagine the pain of just losing one child, but he loses all of them all at once. In probably less than five minutes, Job has lost all of his earthly treasures, essentially, aside from his wife. But how does Job respond? He grieves. That's what tearing your clothes and shaving your head is all about. But he also worships. He grieves and he worships. We might have admired him if he simply grieved. We would say, oh, how stalwart of Job. He's, he hasn't done any more than that. But he does do more than that. He acknowledges the transience of all earthly possessions. And he calls down a blessing on the name of God. He acknowledges that everything he had was given to him by God. And that God has the complete right to take it all away. Blessed be the name of Yahweh, he says. And verse 22 also mentions, lest we miss it, that through all this, Job did not sin. Nor did he blame God. How did Job do that? How is that possible? The smallest thing happens to us. We get late for a job interview, say, and we start blaming God. Ah, God, how could you do this to me? How is it that Job didn't sin at all and even find occasion to bless God's name? We'll come back to that question. But Job is not done being afflicted. Let's go to chapter 2 now. Chapter 2, 1 to 6. Let's read the next section. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before Yahweh, and Satan also came among them to present himself before Yahweh. Yahweh said to Satan, Where have you come from? Then Satan answered Yahweh and said, From roaming about on the earth and walking around on it. Yahweh said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? For there is no one like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, fearing God and turning away from evil, and he still holds fast his integrity although you incited me against him to ruin him without cause. Satan answered Yahweh and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh. He will curse you to your face. So Yahweh said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power, only spare his life. Let's observe this next section. Notice we're back in God's throne room. Sequence of events plays out in the same order that it previously did in chapter 1. God starts the conversation with Satan. God brings up Job. God again notices Job's blamelessness, but he adds a new description. He says, Job still holds fast his integrity. He has not departed from it. But Satan doesn't admit defeat. He proposes a new challenge. He proposes that God afflict Job's person. Maybe someone will be okay with losing all his stuff, but touch his own health, make him physically miserable, and he will abandon and curse you, O God, Satan says. And God gives permission for such affliction, but requires that Satan spare Job's life. So what happens next? Look at verses 7 to 10. And Satan went out from the presence of Yahweh, and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took a potsherd to scrape himself while he was sitting among the ashes. And his wife said to him, You still hold fast your integrity. Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. 
shall we indeed accept good from God and not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And it's a shorter section here. Let's observe. Notice what Satan did to Job. He struck him with boils all over his body. Not just boils, but sore boils. Now, to what exactly is this referring? What are these boils, these inflamed parts appearing all over his body? What disease is this? What affliction is this? We can't say. Can't say for sure. Don't get a complete medical description here. We do get a few other details, though, later on in Job. For example, Job 7.5. Job 7.5, Job says, My flesh is clothed with worms and a crust of dirt. My skin hardens and runs. It's in the sense of, like, emitting a pus. In Job 30.30, Job 30.30, he says also, My skin turns black on me. And my bones burn with fever. So whatever Job had, whatever skin condition, whatever affliction Job had, it was pretty bad. This was a, maybe some type of painful leprosy or a skin parasite or some combination of sickness. This was miserable. And notice what Job does for relief. He scrapes himself with a piece of pottery while he sits in ashes. And then, to top it all off, Job's wife gives him some difficult advice, some heart-rending advice. She says, Job, just curse God and die. Now, we sometimes think of that advice being almost funny because of how unhelpful it is. Like, do, wife, do you really have to say that when I'm suffering all this? But I think, I think this comes from a motivation that we don't often think about. Job's wife probably loves him. She's endured all this infliction with Job. And then she's had to watch as her husband's health has deteriorated rapidly. Not only feels bad for Job, but she, she sees him and he just looks horrified. And so what does she think? Likely, she, she can't see God as anything but cruel. How could you do this, God, to me and to my husband? And therefore, she invites Job to spite God with a curse and then seek his own relief in death. Job, I, I can't bear to see this happen to you. Obviously, God has abandoned us and is cruel. So spite God. Curse him and die. Seek your own relief even though this may be born of some compassion for Job, she has, in a sense, turned her back on God, has not trusted him through this, and has, in a sense, become a tool of the devil, tempting Job to sin. But notice Job's righteous response to her. And it really is righteous. He says, you speak like a foolish woman. Shouldn't we accept both good and adversity from the Lord? This is, this is gracious. He's saying, you're speaking foolishly. This is not typical of you. My wise wife, my God-fearing wife, don't you remember who the Lord is and how we should respond to him? It's amazing that Job can say that when he's, he's the one suffering in particular. And the text says again, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now take away all his possessions, afflict him with the most painful disease, and Job still does not sin or abandon the Lord. You may notice that description is not quite as full as it was in chapter 1. I don't think there's necessarily anything significant about that. It's not as if Job didn't sin with his lips, but he's sinning in his heart. I don't think we have to say that because the rest of the, of the chapter in chapter 2 says that Job is holding fast his integrity. So he hasn't sinned. Even in physical affliction, he has not turned away from Yahweh. So what are we to think of all this? Let's collect these observations now and ask some interpretation questions. How would you describe the relationship of God and Satan when it comes to Satan acting on the earth? What would you say? Yeah, Rob. Uh, Satan submits to God. That's right. Satan submits to God. 
God is in complete control of Satan. Satan cannot act without God's permission. And isn't that so emphatic in the text? Satan comes into God's presence. It's God who directs the conversation. Satan wants to do certain things to Job. He has to get permission from God. And even when God gives Satan permission, he sets strict parameters on what Satan can do. You've heard me say this before, I think, but this is why Martin Luther once famously remarked that the devil is God's devil. Devil is God's devil. Not that God approves of or takes part in Satan's evil schemes, but the devil can do no more than what God purposes. Really, what God has already determined will serve God's glorious and good will. The first at this point, when, Job's make, when Job makes comments on his circumstances, to whom does he attribute his circumstances? To Satan? Not to Satan, but to God. He says, shall we not accept adversity from Yahweh, from God? He recognizes that it's God in control here. God is the one doing this, ultimately, even though the agent is Satan. So these first two chapters, what attribute of God do they most specifically emphasize? Is it not God's sovereignty? His transcendent sovereignty. But why do this? Why go through all of this? Why does God accept this challenge from the devil? It's not as if God is really wondering what's going on in Job's heart. What will really happen if Job loses all his material blessings? God is omniscient. He sees the heart. He knows what Job is and what Job will do. So why go through with it? Why afflict Job to the max for no reason? What is God trying to prove? Well, to answer that question, let's ask another question. What would it have said about God if Job did abandon God as soon as Job's material blessings disappeared? If Job said, I hate God, I'm no longer going to follow him anymore. What would that have said about God? Would it not have defamed him? Would it not have said, you know, God is really not worth holding on to? He doesn't give you what you want, doesn't give you Health and wealth will forget God. But on the flip side, if Job stays with God, worships God, calls down blessings on God, even when God takes away Job's health and blessings, what does that say about God? It says that God is the greatest treasure, doesn't it? That God is most important. God is everything. So I think we can return to the earlier question I raised. How is it that Job endured? How is it that Job did not sin and abandon God in all of this? It's that same truth. Because God was his treasure. Because he saw God as satisfying. If you hold God as your treasure, if you behold God as wonderful, then you will be able to endure even the greatest calamity, even without earthly blessings. If you have God just because of who he is, because of how worthy he is, you have the fountain of life. So what really does it matter if you lose earthly treasures. It doesn't mean there won't be sorrow involved, but your soul is still at rest. I'm thinking of that hymn line, let good and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill. Now, I think that's Martin Luther, right? This is what God is able to testify through the book of Job, even in just these first two chapters. God says, Behold my great worth. When I reveal myself to someone by faith, he will never abandon me. 
I am that great and I am worthy of all worship. Have you discovered that about God? But we still might ask, even if that's the point, is God really just and good to make the point this way? I mean, think about it. In his sovereignty, God has permitted the deaths of Job's servants and his family members. And he's brought intense suffering to Job. If you're trying to prove how good God is, how can a good God do that? How can he bring all that evil, all that suffering, and still be good? I'm not sure that any of us can fully answer that question. This is actually going to be also a part of the book of Job, about showing Something about how transcendent God's ways are above ours. God surely had good purposes, not just for Job, but in the lives of everyone around Job. It's not as if he said, I only care about Job, forget you servants. No, God is intimately caring, working, accomplishing his purposes for everyone involved. All at the same time. This is what God does. He's able to do that. But here's one thing we can say. Beholding God, seeing his glory, and directing others to see it also is more important than life itself. Beholding God is the source of all joy. So if God is going to do that, that is the greatest good man can receive. I mean, think about it. What does Paul say in the New Testament? To live is Christ. God is light. What did Jesus say? You come to me, you come to the fountain of living waters. And what did he say to the Father in John 17 in his high priestly prayer? This is eternal life. What is? That they may know you, the Father, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. To know God is life. To know God is joy. That's the highest good for man. It's even greater than life. Job was a righteous man, was a wise man. He understood this. That's why he endured. But he was going to understand it better at the end of this ordeal. And this is the same for all of us, isn't it? If you're in Christ, to some extent, you understand that God is your ultimate treasure. But as you're sanctified through temptations and sufferings, you realize even more just how much of a treasure God is. You realize even more just how worthy and valuable and precious he is. Job's going to do the same thing. And Job also, he's going to understand the humbling limits of his own knowledge, of his own ability to understand. And this is something we have to realize too. At the end of chapter Job, or end of chapter two of Job, we won't read this, I'll just summarize it. Three friends come to visit Job. These friends are Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And they come to Job to comfort him, to grieve with him. But if you know the story, they end up not doing that. They end up afflicting Job. And their dialogue with Job makes up the majority of the book. And this dialogue is entirely made up of Hebrew poetry. You notice it's probably set that way in the stanzas in your, in your Bibles. And that's kind of interesting, because that means that either these ancient men, they actually spoke this way to one another, or that this is an inspired and accurate summary of their conversation recorded in poetic form. It doesn't mean it's inaccurate. No, the Spirit of God is working this, working uh, to record this. And so this is accurate. And this is authoritative. Though it may not be ex exactly the words that they used. Now, we don't have time to read through all 35 chapters of their conversation. But my study of Job 
I came up with a summary of each one of the chapters of their of the conversation between these men. I'll just present it to you briefly. What are they saying to one another in the chapters that proceed? I'm just going to report this to you as a dialogue. I won't mention each chapter number, but what do Job and his friends have to say? The discussion centers on why all this affliction has come upon Job, and Job starts the discussion. Job says, death is better than life. I wish I had died at birth and not seen this trouble. Eliphaz, you must be in sin. No man can ever be blameless and avoid God's punishment. God's judgment hurts, but his blessings heal. Therefore, repent. Job, you do me wrong to accuse me. If you're so sure I'm sinful, of what sin am I guilty? God appears to want to torture me endlessly for past sins, of which I've already repented. Bildad, your calamity is evidence of judgment for sin. Therefore, repent and be blessed. Job, I am sure I am innocent, though I could never win a case against God. I wish I knew why God delights in oppressing me. So far, God has more understanding than you. You think you're innocent, but God knows you're not. Job, God has all power and is responsible for the rise and fall of both the righteous and the wicked. But your defenses of God make him unjust. I believe God is just. Therefore, I wish I could speak with him and see why all of this is happening. God, why are you determined to show me evil and not good? I long for your goodness. Eliphaz, Job, don't be like the wicked who have miserable lives and swift deaths. Job, God continually abuses me, though I am innocent. If only I had an advocate before him. Even my friends have betrayed me. I have no hope. Bildad, remember, Job, that the life of the wicked is misery. Repent. Job, please just comfort me and stop accusing me. I still trust in God, though I am sure I am innocent. Zophar, the wicked have no joy in this life, only misery and destruction. Job, contrary to your ancient wisdom, many wicked people prosper. Eliphaz, your wickedness is very great. Agree with God's judgment on your sin and be blessed again. Job, I cling to God. I believe he will acquit me. It appears God does not rescue people from their oppressors, nor does he reprove those oppressors. God actually allows many oppressors to prosper for a while before they die. Bildad, Man can never be pure enough in God's sight to avoid judgment. Job, how is it you think you understand God? He is unfathomable. I already know that the way of the wicked is folly. I cling to my innocence. The only one with wisdom is God. Man can only gain wisdom from God himself. I once was blessed by God because of my righteousness. Now my state is miserable. God does not remember my righteousness or turn to help me when I cried him. I agree that if I had been sinful, this calamity would have been just punishment, but I am innocent. Elihu, Elihu is not one of Job's friends, but he's a young companion who seems to have come with this group. He starts to speak. Now let a young one speak. Job, you are wrong to say God doesn't reprove wicked men. God does speak to them through dreams and visions and merciful healings. Job, you are wrong to question God's justice. God is never unjust or misinformed about anyone. Job, you are wrong to find fault with God's attitude toward oppression. God is not obligated to judge men on this earth or to respond to the afflicted cries of those who do not acknowledge him. Job, God does indeed punish evil and reward good. Don't become so obsessed with seeing God's justice yourself that you fall into sin. Job, can you understand the storms that God sends on the earth or withstand their power? What makes you think you can understand God or stand before him? Now, it's at the mention of storms and whirlwinds that God himself appears. God himself breaks into the discussion. 
And this is where we're going to go next. We're now going to examine the last part of the book of Job, these last four chapters, and we'll do different sections. Look at Job 38. Job 38, and we'll look at verses 1 to 7. Job 38, starting verse 1. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now gird up your loins like a man, and I will ask you, and you instruct me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the line on it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? We'll just stop there. Notice God commands Job, prepare to be questioned by me. God then lays a series of questions at Job. You may notice, though, that these questions are all rhetorical. This is not... These are not questions designed for Job to actually respond, but what are they designed to expose? What would you say? Why is God asking Job these questions? It's pointing out a contrast, right? Between whom? between Job and God. These questions are designed to expose the differences between Job and God. These questions all have to do with creation, how God made the world, and how God sustains the world. Uh, not just these questions, but the questions that follow. How God cares for the creatures of the world. How God knows about the creatures of the world. And these are all things that Job does not have knowledge about. Or they are things that the answer is, who has this knowledge? Who did this? God, you did. I didn't do that. Notice, though, even from these first seven verses, God has nothing to say about why he's afflicted Job. Job says, I wish I knew why God was doing this to me. God is not explaining that. He doesn't do it in these seven verses, and he doesn't do it in the questions that follow. This questioning that begins here in chapter 38, it's going to continue all the way until the end of chapter 41. Just a barrage of questions and observations from God that show how different Job is from God. Though God does take a short break at chapter 40, turn to chapter 40. You might remember in some of these chapters we talked about behemoth and leviathan. They appear in these chapters as examples of things that God knows about and God controls, but Job doesn't. But in chapter 40, verses 1 to 5, God takes a short little break to see if Job has anything to say. Look at chapter 40, verses 1 to 5. Then Yahweh said to Job, Will the fault finder contend with the Almighty? Let him who reproves God answer it. Then Job answered Yahweh and said, Behold, I am insignificant. What can I reply to you? I lay my hand on my mouth. Once I have spoken, and I will not answer, even twice, and I will add nothing more. That wasn't enough in terms of God's questioning. Job did have a certain response, but God had more questions for Job. And God does give more questions after this section here in chapter 40, until he lets Job speak again at the beginning of chapter 42. Look at chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. Chapter 42, verses 1 to 6. So God just finished talking about Leviathan. In chapter 41, he says, Look, no man can handle this creature, but I handle this creature. And then Job says, beginning of chapter 42, or verse 1, Then Job answered Yahweh and said, I know that you can do all things, and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? 
Therefore, I have declared that which I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here now I will speak, I will ask you, and you instruct me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I retract, and I repent in dust and ashes. So what is Job acknowledging to God in these two replies, chapter 40 here, or chapter 40 and then chapter 42? Job acknowledges, because God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and Job is not, Job has no right to ever question what God is doing. Job has no right. Job has no ability. Because the difference between God and Job is that great. Nowhere in God's speech to Job does God explain to Job why God did what he did, or the purpose of Job's suffering. Rather, through all of this, what is God doing? He's reminding Job that Job must simply trust him. God is always just. God is always good. God is always wise. No person, not Job, and not you, and not me, no person has the right or ability to question God or his motives at any time. And that truth is not meant to depress you. It's meant to liberate you. Because remembering the difference between you and God means that you really can trust him. And it will give you the ability to endure even great trials. This truth, it should cause you to cling to promises like Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Now, that verse is not simply a platitude or some overused scriptural band-aid. That is bedrock. That is a foundation for you when you endure various trials. Because you can trust your God. All things work together for good, both good events and bad events, if you belong to Jesus Christ. So, does getting fired from your job work to your good? It does. Does having a miscarriage work to your good? It does. Does even being killed by ISIS because you're a Christian work together for your good? It does. But we ask, how? How could these things work to my good? And things like these it may not feel like it to the flesh. It certainly doesn't look like it to non-sanctified eyes. But let's learn the primary lesson of Job. We will often not see specifically how something is good, how something is wise, or how something is just. But we can know that it is because we know God and because we know God's unchanging character. So we don't have to have the dots filled in for us, the dots connected for us. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. But when we can't, we say, I will still trust God because he knows what he's doing. Now, of course, the Bible does reveal specifically certain benefits that come from trials and tragedies. Things like the refinement of Christian character to be more like Christ, an opportunity to witness Christ to the world, confirmation to us of the genuineness of our own faith. And for those who don't know God, trials and tragedies can even draw them to God in repentance and faith. And even Christians can be drawn to repentance in this way. But again, even when we can't see the specific benefit the specific wisdom, or the specific justice of an act of God, we must still humble ourselves before God as Job did. God is the potter. We are the clay. Isn't that what Romans 9 says? And think about the difference between clay and a potter. Think about the intelligence difference, the wisdom difference, 
Clay doesn't even have a mind. It was never trained. It was never educated. God says, this is a picture of the difference between me and you. My ways, my wisdom, my understanding, and yours. God's the creator. We are merely creatures. King David, I think, rightly captured the attitude we should have in Psalm 131. It's a short psalm. Psalm 131, I'll just quote it to you. It's only three verses. But this is what David said. O oh, Yahweh, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty, nor do I involve myself in great matters or in things too difficult for me. Surely I have composed and quieted my soul like a weaned child rests against his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me. O oh, Israel, hope in Yahweh from this time forth and forever. To hear the truth of that song says, I don't go above my pay grade. Israel, trust God. Solomon saw the same thing. He records it succinctly in Proverbs 3, 5. You know this verse, Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in Yahweh with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. So brethren, think about what this truth means for your life right now. What are the trials that you're going through? Are you left without answers? Are you bewildered as to how God is being faithful to himself and to his word? Well, don't despair. Remember how much bigger God is, and how much more transcendent his ways are. In this life, we may never understand why God did or allowed a certain thing to happen to us or to those we love. God, why? Why did I get this sickness? God, why? Why did you allow that person to die? We might not ever get the answers to that. But we can know that God is always good. He's always wise. He's always just. He doesn't owe us an explanation. We owe him our trust. And one more thing. We can know that we will eventually see our faith vindicated because this is what God demonstrates in the last part of the book of Job. You see, the book doesn't simply end with Job's rebuke. It ends with God's generous restoration of Job. Look at Job 42, verses 10 to 17. Job 42, verses 10 to 17. Yahweh restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and Yahweh increased all that Job had twofold. Then all his brothers and all his sisters and all who had known him before came to him, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they consoled him and comforted him for all the adversities that Yahweh had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of money and each a ring of gold. Yahweh blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a 1,000 yoke of oxen and a 1,000 female donkeys. He had seven sons and three daughters, and in the first Jemima and the second Kezia, and the third, Karen Hapuk. In all the land, no women were found so fair as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance among their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his grandsons, four generations. And Job died, an old man and full of days. And again, no explanation. No explanation from God to Job. God's ways are indeed mysterious and past understanding, but they are always just and wise and compassionate. God was not obligated to do for Job what he did here, not obligated to, to double Job's possessions, but he did so because it fit his perfect purposes and who God is. He wanted to demonstrate that God does indeed know how to reward the righteous. And this is exactly what James 5.11 says. James 5.11 James writes, we count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. So God will vindicate our faith. Yes, he might bring us through bewildering, staggeringly painful trials. 
but he will vindicate our faith and he will reward the righteous. Now, two quick questions before we end. One question we might ask is, did Job sin? He didn't sin in the beginning, for sure. We hear that explicitly. But the questioning and complaining that takes place in chapters 3 to 37, did Job fall into sin, and is he not to be imitated? We have to be careful in answering this question, because on the one hand, God clearly rebukes Job for finding fault with God and seeking, practically demanding an explanation from God. And for that reason, Job confessed his fault, and he repented, as Job says he does. But on the other hand, Job is held up in other parts of the Bible, like James that we just read, as an example of righteousness and endurance. And, we didn't read this, but God instructs Job's friends at the end of the book of Job to ask Job to pray on their behalf. Because God says to them in Job 42, 7, My wrath is kindled against you, Eliphaz, and against your two friends, because you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has. Huh. God, after all that discussion, he commends Job for speaking rightly about God. So did, did Job sin or didn't he? Did he have to repent or didn't he? I think the answer is a little bit of both. Job certainly didn't sin initially, even when he lost his health proving that Satan was dead wrong about the worth of God and the power of faith. But in the subsequent conversation, due to the constant provocation of his friends and the weakness of his own flesh, Job slipped into sin. It was not wrong for Job to present his griefs to God or to even express to God how he didn't understand what God was doing. And we see the same thing in many other parts of Scripture. Go to Habakkuk, go to the Psalms, you hear this. It's not wrong for God's people to lament to God, to say, God, I don't understand. This is really painful for me. Additionally, Job does affirm, even in his lament, his continued and fundamental devotion to God. But Job erred at times when he actually began to question God's motives. And in seeking, to, de, or seeking and demanding an explanation from God as to how Job's circumstances were just and good. But overall, Job is an example of righteous endurance. One final question. In light of the trials that Job faced, how would you respond to someone who made the claim that trials in your life or an illness that you're suffering is the result of unrepentant sin? This is important. Sometimes trials or sicknesses are the direct results of sin. Sin does have natural consequences after all, even when we repent. For example, if you, if you have an immoral lifestyle and you contract a sexually transmitted disease, even if you repent, that consequence remains with you. That's just a, a natural outcome. That's a consequence of sin. Sin does bring this kind of experience. But trial or sickness is not necessarily the result of sin, as we see with Job. God may simply be sanctifying us or working some grand purpose that we don't understand. And you remember that section in the New Testament, disciples find this man who's blind from birth. They say, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he'd be born blind? I mean, look, he's got this terrible calamity. There must be sin involved somewhere. Sin brought this about. Jesus says, no. It wasn't this man or his parents. This happened so that the glory of God might be displayed in his life. It's the same with us. And we should also remember that God's not going to have to punish us because, hey, even if you've repented, sin needs punishment. No, if we're in Christ, all our sin has already been punished. At the cross, there's nothing left over for us to pay. Even the sins we've yet to commit, they have been judicially satisfied at the cross. So it's not as if God has to say, sorry, I still got to zap you. No, that's all done. So remember this. Looking to positive or negative circumstances in your life to understand God's will or his approval of you is an error. It is a mistake. And it is one of the most common mistakes that Christians make and have made since the time of Christ. Let's remember that God does not speak to us through circumstances. 
if you want to know whether God approves you or God approves of a choice that you've made in your life, what is the only way to know? It's the scriptures. It's the revealed will of God. If you want to know what pleases God, go to what he said. Because anything else could be misinterpreted. Things going well for you doesn't mean God approves of you. Have a peace in your heart doesn't mean that you're doing the right thing. There have been plenty of people who had peace in their hearts when they did evil. You just have a feeling that God wants you to do a certain thing. That might be right. might be wrong. Because your feelings have to be informed by truth. And where do we find truth? The only reliable presentation of truth is the scriptures. That's why Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord, but the things revealed, they belong to us and to our sons so that we might keep this law. We might keep God's law. So when you encounter a trial, you encounter sickness, don't say, or when you see it in somebody else, don't say, oh, this must be because of sin. It's always good to, to check your life to see, am I not walking with the Lord? But remember, it may just be that God is sanctifying you through that. He's sanctifying that other person and glorifying himself through the trial. Let's not make the same mistake that Job's friends made. They said true things about God, but they misapplied that truth. All right, it went a little bit, a little bit over there. There's more to say about the book of Job. We've tried to cram it all in one lesson, but that'll have to do for today. If you have questions about the lesson or questions about the things I've said, please email me. But that's all for this week. Next week, we go back to Genesis and we finally encounter a certain man named Abram. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we know that we must humble ourselves before you in light of what we've heard from the book of Job today. That's not only what we must do, but that's the way to joy. Lord, when we question you, when we demand an explanation from you, we will not have joy because it's not the way you designed us to be. You designed us to depend on you and to remember the difference between us and you. God, we thank you that you are good, just, and wise, and that even when we don't understand, we can rest in that. And Lord, we can also rest in the truth that you vindicate those who look to you. You will be faithful, God. Even when man is unfaithful, you will be faithful. And you approve yourself a rewarder of the righteous. We're not righteous in our own, God, but we are. We have been made righteous in Christ, and we thank you for that. Well, it helps to walk in righteousness and in faith before you. And be with us, just as you promised, you already will be with us in every trial. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you all. See you again next week.